Hi there. Uh, in today's lecture, we're going to be looking at the positivism and interpretivism debate when it comes to researching society, and we're going to focus in on the study of suicide. Uh, so when you think about suicide, which is a highly sensitive subject, um, most of us perceive it as a very individual act to choose to take one's own life. However, sociologists have argued for some time now that there are actually social causes to suicide um, and actually it's quite easy to spot patterns of suicide on a global scale, for example, that we'll look at shortly. However, sociologists differ on the methods they would use to discover these social causes of suicide and we are going to examine the positivist approach to studying suicide and look at the interpretivist approach to the study of suicide. Um, we've got a couple of pictures there, see if you recognise the gentleman on the left, um, uh, an infamous suicide case, and if you can think about what the uh, case, the picture on the right represents, we'll be talking about that in class as well. So one of the big questions we need to think about, and we will come back to this when we try and think about how objective Durkheim really was, was why on earth did he choose to study suicide in 1897, which is when he, he published his book on the causes of suicide. You've got to think about the context of this time period. It was the 19th century, the end of the 19th century. The Industrial Revolution had been powering on for about 100 years. And we had gone through a scientific revolution um, in the centuries previous called the Enlightenment period. Science was now the dominant um, paradigm. Science was the way that we explain things. Um, and as a positivist, Durkheim believed that it was pos possible to use scientific methods of research in order to investigate and establish patterns um, in the social world, the same way that science had done in the natural world. And he believed that these patterns could uh, become what he called social laws or social facts. This was ultimately because Durkheim uh, fundamentally believed that we could use these social laws and these social patterns to help predict future events. Uh, and if these future events were negative or, or social problems, uh, we could use sociological research to develop social policies to help tackle them. Um, so if Durkheim could actually prove that the individual act of suicide had an actual social cause, then he believed, and his teacher Comte believed, that this would establish sociology as an academic discipline. And ultimately, no matter the strengths and weaknesses of his research, it really did establish sociology as an academic discipline that people took seriously. So how did he actually go about doing his research? Uh, well, he was a positivist, so the most, one of the most positivist research methods is the use of statistics. So he used suicide statistics from several Western European countries. So looking at suicide on a very macro scale, looking at suicide rates at, at, at a level of the nation state. Now, he regarded these statistics as what he called social facts. He, he thought that they were completely true representations of the level of suicide in each of these countries. And he felt that if he could establish correlations but, and reveal causal relationships which led to suicide. Uh, for example, one of the things that he quickly disproved that there was that there was no relationship between the weather and patterns of suicide. People had believed that the warmer the weather, the lower the level of suicide. He was able to prove that that wasn't true. So just to give you a bit of background about what he actually discovered slash um, his theory of suicide, I thought I'd talk you through his main theory. Um, following his research, he argued that uh, there were two factors or two concepts that could explain the different levels of suicide for different countries. One was uh, the level of social integration or the degree to which individuals were integrated into society, so think about sense of belonging, etc. And the other was social regulation. And this is a degree to which societies regulate or control an individual's behaviour. Um, so if you don't have control, you might feel that you're too regulated and possibly feel suicidal. If you had too little of either of these, or too much, he argued this made suicide more likely. So if we look at the following examples, he came up with, if you like, four different reasons for suicide, or four different types of suicide, which I can talk you through very quickly. Um, the first one was uh, the idea that social integration was too weak. This is when people don't feel a sense of belonging, and they don't feel that they, um, they, they share maybe the shared norms and values of those around them. Um, possibly don't see people very often, maybe feel lonely. And one of the main ways he established that is because he looked at suicide rates among Catholics and Protestants, or predominantly Catholic and Protestant countries. Um, and he argued that Catholic countries had much lower levels of suicide when compared to Protestant. 
And one of the ways he explained this was because Catholics went to church far more regularly, like twice, maybe three times a week. The services last, lasted much longer, whereas Protestant services were, A, much shorter, and there was also less onus on people to go to church if you're a Protestant. Remember, Protestants believe that you can pray to God for your, for your sins and get forgiveness, whereas Catholics are very much, you have to go to church to um, confess to the local uh, priest, and uh, they will forgive your sins. So as a result of going to church more often, people came into contact with other people, so they were much more integrated. They were part of a bigger community. Whereas he argued Protestants felt more socially isolated and as a result weren't integrated and suicide rates were much higher. And, and he mainly compared this, for example, if you look at the, if he, he looked at the suicide statistics between the United Kingdom or England and Scotland and Wales, um, and he compared this with Southern Ireland, which was a, it is a Catholic country. That's the one that we're really going to do a lot more on. If we're going like, to refer back to that particular reason more often this year. The other three reasons are important just to be aware of. Um, he said, actually, sometimes social integration can be far too strong. And this might be when someone sacrifices their lives, their life in sense, uh, for a sense of duty to others. So there are a number of examples in that. There are Hindu wives who can sometimes throw themselves on the, the funeral prior of their husband when they die. Um, uh, there are Japanese kamikaze pilots, which is the image that I referred to at the very beginning of the lecture, who sacrifice themselves for their, their country for honour during World War II. And elderly Inuits who believe in this sort of practice, if you like, of almost dying from exposure when they, they'll walk out into, uh, onto the ice and die from exposure rather than be a burden on their community. They sacrifice themselves for others. There are the more modern examples of that, you know, soldiers in Afghanistan throwing themselves on, on mines to protect their um, uh, fellow soldiers, I guess, um, and sacrificing themselves for others. So there are more modern examples of this. Uh, the other two look at regulation, uh, social regulation being too weak. So this is when um, the individual maybe doesn't feel um, that they're regulated by society. There's been rapid social change. They, they've got no real idea about, um, you know, the norms and values. They, they suffer what's called an anime because there's lots of uncertainty. And he said, for example, suicide rates increased when there was economic booms, when people did really well really quickly, which changed things, and also busts, okay, so recessions, for example, and economic depressions. And the final one is when social regulation is too strong. And he said, this is very common among slaves, which is obviously now rare in industrial societies, but we see much more current examples amongst the prison population. They're obviously very highly regulated and controlled. They haven't got very, they've got very limited free will, and this can lead to suicide, according to Durkheim. Um, so let's have a look at more up-to-date statistics and see if there's any evidence of the Durkheim's view. Um, this gives us um, a, a very basic uh, graph at the suicide rates. Um, can any of you think about why the suicide rate for men is so much higher than the suicide rate for women? What is it about men? And if you think about those four different categories above, you know, why, why might men be more likely to, unfortunately, commit suicide compared to women? And I think it might be, think about what they're like in terms of social situations. Why do we think men might be more likely to commit suicide than women? Um, interestingly enough, and this is a bit of a criticism of Durkheim, when he uncovered this pattern, which he did in his research back in 1897, he actually said that the reason women uh, were less likely to commit suicide is because they're much more easily satisfied than men far less prone to anime, like a sense of isolation, and happy in the company of pets. Um, but he actually provided no evidence to back up this view that women were happy in the, in the company of pets uh, as opposed to men. So I guess that's one of the evaluation points against Durkheim. He did make some generalisations with um, no real data to back up his point of view. So we've already started being a bit more critical of Durkheim. So let's have a think about the strengths and weaknesses of his study. On the one hand, Durkheim's study is the perfect example of positivist research. He uses what we'd say objective, quantitative data to establish cause and effect relationships between individual acts, in this case suicide, and wider society. So how integrated people feel, how much of a sense of belonging they have, how regulated they are. Or is it that perfect? Now, interpretivists would argue that the problem with Durkheim's research ultimately rests with his use of official statistics and his assumption that they are true. Interpretivists would say that they are actually not accurate uh, and actually they're the reflection of a complicated social process, which means socially, they are socially constructed. 
effectively they're arguing that these statistics might not even be right, um, let alone not tell us the true meaning behind the, the behaviour of suicide. They might not actually be accurate in the first place. And to understand this, I think we have to have a look at where suicide statistics actually come from. So I thought we'd have a quick look at the definition of suicide. Um, and according to the Office of National Statistics in the UK, suicide is defined as deaths given an underlying cause of intentional self-harm or injury po or poisoning of undetermined intent. Uh, and it's worth noting that where injuries or poisonings have an undetermined intent, uh, but harm was inflicted, they, and there's not enough evidence to prove that it was intentional, uh, they generally are ruled as death by misadventure, mostly. Okay, so if it's not completely clear that someone intentionally wanted to kill themselves, quite often it won't be ruled as suicide, it'll be ruled as death by misadventure. Now, the key people in this process that we're going to be examining now are coroners. Now, coroners are effectively judges that determine how someone died. When someone dies, there will normally be a coroner who has to sign a death certificate. If it's more complicated than, you know, someone passing away in their sleep in their 90s, quite often there'll be a hearing where people will come and present evidence to coroners in, the, in like a, a courtroom, if you like. But there's only one coroner, there's no jury or what have you, but they will sit, hear evidence from doctors, family members, etc., to try and establish why or how someone died. Now, this kind of brings us to the nub of the problem. There are significant issues when trying to define a case as a suicide, and it all generally rests on the judgment of the coroner. Um, and there's some famous people here who have been ruled as committing suicide, but it is worth thinking about, was it actually a suicide? So, um, was it mental health or a choice, for example? Um, if someone kills themselves because they are suffering schizophrenia, um, if they kill themselves because they're suffering significant depression, is it them really choosing to kill themselves? Is that intent or is it the mental illness killing them the same way, for example, cancer unfortunately kills people and that's a disease killing people. If mental health is a disease, is that killing people? So it's thinking about what is actually, is it, what, where is the choice? Another thing to think about is if, if there are people there to speak up for the person. Um, if, you, um, if it is a suicide case that's got lots of friends and family and they present evidence of how wonderful this person was, is that more likely to maybe you know, to get the coroner to rule that this person probably didn't commit suicide, as opposed to maybe someone who's homeless who had no friends and family to speak up for them? A coroner might be like, well, yeah, this is much more likely to be a suicide. And ultimately, were there errors in, invest in the medical investigation of the cause of death, particularly Durkheim's data based in the 19th century statistics, quite clearly medicine hadn't advanced as much as it had today. So it's quite likely that many of those um, deaths, for example, that were recorded as suicide, that could be wrong. They could, have been, they could have been murders, they could have been accidental deaths, all sorts. So we can't necessarily trust the validity of the original data that Durkheim based his research on. Other issues to consider when trying to define something as a suicide was, well, what if there was no suicide note? Okay. If there's no suicide note, how do you know that that was intentional? Uh, and that's particularly difficult if the mode of death is not clear. So, you know, perhaps someone hanging themselves, that's a pretty, like, clear, I'm attempting to commit suicide. But someone may be driving their car really fast into a wall. That could be an accident. So how do you decide whether that was a suicide or not? You have to look at their background. You have to look at their life. You have to look at their social media account. You have to interview their relatives. And quite quickly, you realise this coroner's judgment becomes quite clouded by subjective interpretation of data, as opposed to this, like, this is clear suicide and this is clearly not a suicide. And I suppose the most difficult job for a coroner when it comes to suicide is what if it wasn't a suicide attempt? <clears throat> What if it was just a cry for help and wasn't actually intentional? And that's where the real challenge is. Because coroners, if they establish that, you know what, this is a cry for help, they will not rule it as a suicide. They'll see it as death by misadventure. So when considering the interpretivist approach to investigating suicide or criticising Durkheim's study of suicide, Douglas is um, an interactionist who talked about suicide statistics being complete social constructions. Um, he was keen to point out that it's not actually defined as a suicide until a coroner judges it so. So someone's death is just a death until a coroner judges it as a suicide. And he would argue that actually that's a social process. And he said there is an argument that coroner's judgments, they can get it wrong. They might have wrong information. 
Or, more interestingly, they might be influenced by social factors. And that can include things like location, um, family, uh, personal circumstances of the victim, etc. So location, I've given you there the example of Ireland. So Southern Ireland traditionally has had a a lower suicide rate than um, the rest of the United Kingdom. Now, Douglas was argued that in Ireland, because it's a Catholic country, there might be many reasons why a coroner might be more reluctant to rule something as a suicide. Some of you may be aware that within the Catholic faith, if you commit suicide, you go to hell, for example. That is their belief system. You can't get buried in hallowed ground, for example. So coroners in Ireland, Douglas would argue, perhaps are more reluctant to give out the suicide verdict because it has way more implications um, for the victim's soul. And if the coroner is a religious person, that might be something they think about. But also for the family members that are left behind. And actually, he did point out that the suicide verdict is not an objective verdict. He said it's a negotiation between the police, relatives and the coroners in those hearings, those court hearings, where the coroner will ask relatives questions, the relatives will try and suggest one view of someone. Likewise, the police might suggest something. And there is also the argument that, again, in a Catholic country or a very religious country, would a family member perhaps hide evidence to show that it was a suicide because they might ultimately believe in the soul going to hell if you commit suicide? Would they hide the suicide note, for example? So perhaps the actual suicide statistics themselves are not accurate and actually they're distorted to reflect um, the values, I suppose, of the country the suicide's perhaps taking place in. Um, I've already mentioned this earlier on. Um, So if a man uh, has a brand new family, sorry, if someone's committed suicide, uh, a man who's got a brand new family, uh, there's an argument that they might be much less likely to be ruled a suicide than a man who has no family. And that links back to the fact that, well, that guy that's got the family will have people to come in to say, actually, no, this guy was really happy. He had a really good life. You know, there's no way this is suicide. Um, Someone who has no family or friends, perhaps, won't have those people representing that side of their personality. So they'll be more likely to be ruled a suicide. It's not because one of them definitely was and one of them definitely wasn't. It's just because it's a socially constructed process. According to Douglas, the only true way we can uncover the meaning of suicide and really get to the bottom of why people do commit suicide is through very detailed case studies. So focusing in on individual cases, looking at the letter, interviewing the relatives, finding out about their background, and that would be the only way we can do that research. And that's obviously going to be qualitative research. So, um, therefore... Douglas's work and the interpretive perspective would argue that Durkheim's study is pretty useless as the statistics might be wrong in the first place and ultimately the statistics can only tell us the pattern. They don't tell us the real causes of why people actually decided to make that choice. So these are some up-to-date statistics on suicide rates globally. Now remember Durkheim's research was only on Western Europe. Okay, So we could argue it was quite Eurocentric in, in the first place. He didn't look at the whole world, for example. So we can't maybe apply his rules to the whole world. But can you see any evidence in this image to back up Durkheim's assertions that, you know, if people are too regulated, too, too much control, suicide rates are much higher? Likewise, are there any patterns between Catholic and Protestant countries where, according to Durkheim, Catholics are less likely, Protestants more likely to commit suicide? Uh, And just to give you an idea, obviously the dark red is where suicide rates are much higher. Um, Dark orange, a little bit less higher. Lighter orange, a little bit less higher. And the light beige is where the lowest suicide rates are. Okay, so see if you can find any evidence to back up Durkheim or perhaps disagree with Durkheim, because I can spot a couple on there straight away that challenges Durkheim's point of view. Thanks for listening.